Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Moses and you are listening to the HP Leader podcast and this is a special edition podcast with the theme of changing the culture of conversations within our allied health professionals and this is a series of three podcasts and this one is aimed at the emerging leader audience so that's anyone that's kind of in a more senior role doing appraisals and we're not being so specific about banding but maybe when you're managing people managing teams and you've got a few years of experience um, behind you so i'm delighted to be joined by a fantastic panel today and they're going to introduce themselves so i'm going to start with sharon hi everyone so i'm sharon ajay nickel i'm a clinical academic speech and language therapist I've um, been working for about 16 years and currently um, just finished a PhD and I'm about to start a lecturing role um, and I also work in independent practice. I'm um, Black British African, um, so I was born in the UK, in Essex specifically, and uh, my parents are both of Ghanaian heritage. Thank you. Ganesh. Hi guys, um, I'm Ganesh Balia. Um, I'm the regional head of AHPs for the Midlands and East of England for Health Education England. Uh, podiatrist by background, working in podiatric surgery. And um, my parents are from South India um, and Tamil. And I was born in St Mary's Hospital in London. Fabulous, not too far from me. Jemima. Hi everyone, I'm Jemima and I'm a physiotherapist by background. I work as a first contact physiotherapist in GP practices at the moment. Um, I have a master's in public health and I just completed a global health fellowship um, in South Africa looking at um, stroke management in acute hospital. I am Nigerian, so I was born in Nigeria, lived there for some time, then moved to Ireland um, and lived there, the real Ireland, Republic, <laughs> lived there for about 10 years um, and then moved and here to, to study. So, yeah. Thank you. Rafia. Hi, um, I'm Rafia Badat. I am a speech and language therapist and like Sharon, I'm also a clinical researcher. Um, I'm currently doing my PhD in um, exploring digital therapy. Um, I will, I um, Indian by background, so I was born in London, then grew up in the north, then returned to London. I've been here about 10 years. Um, my family uh, are Indian via Burma, which is also known as Myanmar, so lots of different influences to bring me to where I am now. Thank you. And Adine. Good evening, everybody. My name's Nadine Adonis. I'm a physiotherapist, clinical specialist in neurology, both a clinician and a researcher. I am originally from Cape Town, South Africa. So in South Africa, I'm known as a Cape Colored and outside of South Africa in the rest of the world, I'm known as Black. Well, thank you so much. And I am so incredibly grateful for the panel today. We've got a real diversity in the panel in terms of opinion. And we've been having a little chat um, offline before we prepared for this. And it's actually a massive ask. So I'm really grateful that everyone's put themselves out to have the conversation. So to set the scene, in a time where racial injustice is so visible in our society, like you know never before for our generation this is something that isn't new this is something that has been around for many many years and if we think back we can think of many other cases of racial injustice um, that have been in our time and have we ever really acted on them have we really thought about the impact have things changed and as senior emerging leaders of our professions now is the time to start thinking. Now is the time to start doing. We have a social movement in the Black Lives Matters. We have a disparity report from Public Health England as we go through the tragedy of COVID-19. And if there's anything that should make us stop and think about our own identity, about our own understanding, speaking personally from our white privilege, and understanding our, our culture and how that frames us to not just live our lives, but also our professional lives as well. And in the previous podcast that I've spoken about, I talk about my leadership journey and it started about 10 years ago. So if you're the band 
six band seven band eight a that sat at the other end of the screen i've been there and i've learned things about myself that i never thought were there i used to you know think i'm, I'm not a racist so i don't need to look for problems i've sat and thought well you know i'm, I'm in a mixed race marriage i've got friends of color but that's not enough being a non-racist is not enough, especially when you're a leader and a manager of your profession. Mm -hmm. You have to do things differently. You have to learn how you can support colleagues who have had disadvantages because of the colour of your skin that you haven't had. And for people realising that can be quite uncomfortable. For people starting to learn about that it can be quite uncomfortable because people will think it's it's not my fault it's not my fault I was born white it's not my fault I've been given this privilege and nobody's saying it is what I'm saying to you is a British white physiotherapist who's had that privilege is it is our responsibility to learn and only when we learn can we then help support people who have disadvantages that mean we may will not have had and that's the big message that I wanted to get across to you now is my platform as a senior leader and I promised myself in this leadership journey that that's exactly what I'd do so it's all well and good me sitting here talk, telling you that but what is the point and what action do we need well part of starting the conversations within my workplace my networks my regions and then nationally I wanted to ask my white colleagues and peers if they're reaching out to their BAME staff and supporting them in this time of need. It's such an emotional time for our BAME colleagues. And if you don't understand why, you need to educate yourself why. And that's something we can, I can help you with, but that does not lie in the hands of our colleagues of colour. That's our responsibility to learn. But one of the things we need to do is start the conversation so people can learn and support their BAME colleagues. So I'm dead nervous. I'm dead nervous about saying the wrong things. I've got a dry mouth. I was saying to the panel, like I'm constantly drinking water. But do you know, saying nothing is not an option. And saying nothing is not an option because silence is so much more powerful than saying the wrong thing and, and admitting you've said the wrong thing. I've, I've, there's been situations in my life where I've learned the most from doing or saying the wrong thing and then learning from it and accepting the responsibility that it's not quite right. So as part of some of the research, um, people have told me they feel uncomfortable having the conversation or reaching out to BAME colleagues because they're fearful of saying the wrong thing. They're fearful of using the wrong language. They're fearful of someone coming back and saying, I'm not okay. What do I do with that? And why is it uncomfortable? I don't know. I want to ask the panel, first of all, how we reach out to our BAME staff as those managers, as people who are managing the teams, how do you reach out in a tactful and careful way? How, how, does anyone have any you know, ideas or thoughts about how that might be approached? Who wants to come in first? Jemima. Uh, um, I just wanted to say that this, I think it, it has to do with fear. Um, you know, as you've described, having a dry mouth and not being sure what to say, and it goes both ways. Um, I think from, you know, I can speak from my perspective, right? We've always had these conversations. You know, Bain people have always had these conversations. This is not new, as you've rightly said, but it's always been within private spaces uh, or amongst ourselves or with our friends or with family members or people that we trust. And what Black Lives Matter has done and this kind of newfound attention is that we're now having to talk about these things on a public sort of platform, you know, in public spaces. Um, and it's a bit daunting, it takes a lot of vulnerability. Um, it takes, um, yes, a lot of bravery, essentially, to talk about these things. So I think um, my advice would be to be gentle, right? Just to be gentle, but to be human and kind. I think kindness goes a long way. And I think, you know, as clinicians, we're quite good at um, detecting things and we're emotionally aware and we can discern when someone is kind and when someone is unkind. So I think it helps just, yeah, just to be kind, really. Yeah, that's my advice. 
Yeah, I think from my own learning as well, one of the reasons why this is an emotional subject is because um, in particular, the black community felt they could relate to that death. Mm. And that was them putting themselves and their family in that, mem in that space. Yeah. And it's affecting everyone of colour. We, the, you know, the, the social movement is, is Black Lives Matter, but it is so much more than that. Mm. This is why I think it's, it's in that kindness and that humanity you talked about. If anyone had experienced other kind of traumatic event in their life, the natural reaction would be to ask if that person's okay. You know, but it, why is it so difficult when it comes to race and ethnicity? Why, why is that? Sharon, can I come in to you? I mean, that's an interesting question about the why. And, and I think part of the, by, by the continuing being silent, I think actually that breeds this more fear in, in kind of bringing up the conversation and kind of that avoidance then kind of sets it up to be a more difficult conversation. And I think, you know, just starting from a place of honesty, actually, you know, there's nothing wrong in acknowledging like I, I actually don't know how to approach this but I really want to you know and actually that honesty kind of we will hopefully have like a meaningful and you know conversation I think acknowledgement is a really important aspect of it I think it's it's not about being defensive or about kind of you know if you do get it wrong you know just just accept that acknowledgement that I might get it wrong it, it might not come out right and and to kind of acknowledge that you kind of want to know my other thing is that kind of about the, um, the sometimes I, I think it's about why you're asking certain questions. I think if as a BAME person, if I know somebody's genuinely interested in asking me something, if they might use the wrong terminology or something that I wouldn't personally want to use, but I can see that it's genuine interest and, you know, um, it's coming from a place of one's genuinely wanting to know. I think that's different to somebody um, coming across as a bit tokenistic or perhaps just kind of almost want, want to make fun or something so I think it's about the kind of why 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 do what's the conversation like what's the background to the conversation acknowledging being honest about the fact that you might that you, you don't know what to say and and I think you know then then the conversation can come from there and I think um because often the, the worry about not wanting to say actually then leads to more, more more fear more silence and we've just kind of got to this point now where finally hopefully there's a bit more of an open discussion happening but my, my key thing to be acknowledging and being honest about why you're having the conversation in the first place absolutely less awkward adine can i come into you please we always talk about authentic conversations and sometimes we don't necessarily fully grasp what that means and for me an authentic conversation is somebody taking an interest when they ask me how are you doing being genuine about it being honest about it and giving enough time to have that conversation and to develop that conversation at the end of the day these conversations and these safe spaces are built on trust and is built on relationships and if you don't have any of those ingredients I'm never going to want to have a straightforward, honest conversation because straightforward and honest to all of us means very different things. And we are very much aware that we end, we may end up offending people by ourselves saying the wrong thing or approaching it in a way that maybe doesn't mesh up with them. Absolutely. I'm just like listening to every word you say there, team. Rafia. Um, I guess just building on what everyone else has said in terms of whether there's a right language or a wrong language, I don't think it's about that. It's about the right intention and the intention of a, a manager as part of their role is to support their staff and to build those relationships with their staff. And it's not a one-off conversation. So actually it's not about using the la right language in one space in time. It's about um, starting that conversation, being very upfront and honest if you don't feel comfortable and, um, it's it's a two-way process maybe neither of the people in that situation feel comfortable but that's all right you give it a go and better that than this silence of not addressing things at all um and and kind of reviewing and reflecting and which is part of a leader's role anyway so it's part of, the skill set is there and it's no different to any other situation it's just about setting the wheels in motion um, and then continuing that and reflecting and coming back to it um, and also i guess in terms of it is a complex um, 
situation and I was just reflecting myself in terms of specifically when when all of this came out in terms of BAME people from BAME backgrounds whether staff or service users being a greater risk and I felt oh yep yeah, I'm a BAME health member of staff I, I can you know um, my identity fits with that and then when it was more the black lives matters i i did reflect um am i an ally or uh, what is my role in that i feel a lot of empathy and i can see what's this is happening and it fits with experiences that i've had and the conversations i've had but i don't want to jump on that board you know and so it's not just to do with white <laughs> people from white background versus people from vain background it's much more complex than that but it's also not that complex it's about individual relationships and individual situations and when it comes down to a, a leader in healthcare that is their role and if that's part of that's part of their role and duty and and so some in sometimes in some ways you can boil it down to that and you know, I'm going to be completely frank and honest right now. If I think of myself 10 years ago, and I think if this happened 10 years ago and I hadn't been on this journey that I'd been understanding my white privilege culture and my own identity, and then understanding others over the last 10 years, I don't think I would have put that correlation together. I think this is a fact. Being people are more at risk. That's awful. But actually, what, I don't have responsibility of that that's nothing I can change. So there's a risk. We're going to protect staff like we protect pregnant staff and we'll protect people with comorbidities. So this is just another box that we then have to, you know, investigate that, you know, have you got this risk factor? It's so much more than that. It's so much more the meaning that anxiety, you're having something that you could take home to your family who are more vulnerable because they're older or your children are you. So I think, again for the people listening to this it's okay if you didn't make that that direct correlation but now you have people telling you there is one and why it's important you recognize that so i can, i think we've kind of moved on to the the that um the risk and there's been a lot oh ganesh do you want to come in just just wanted to share actually with if you don't mind i'm, I'm, any, I'm not um dropping the tone but i think extended to friends I'll share with you a story um, uh, one of my very very close friends his uh, wife was away so there was a there was an international football game on and he invited a few of the mates to come around I'll, I'll do, a, do a roast for us all so so we we all went round um, and we we're watching the game and he took me aside actually and he says hey, Ganesh I couldn't remember what religion you are so I played it safe and cooked beef now, I'm not religious, but my family are Hindu, so it was totally the wrong thing to cook. But I said to him, I said, look, you've known me for years. Why, have we, why, can, why do you not feel comfortable speaking to me about this? Why have you not felt comfortable asking, you know, what, uh, you know, about my background, about, you know, um, my religion and things like that? So it, the conversations don't occur always amongst friends and family, regardless about the institutes. Uh, and, and our workplaces so that, that it's like you say it's if it's if it's prevalent in society and the role modeling's you know not there or we don't feel enabled to have those conversations it makes it a lot more difficult then to to have it in a more formal um um, um situation that's all i was going to say oh, no, no more jokes after that <laughs> no that but that is such a powerful point about british culture and this is what for yeah. people that don't understand what i keep meaning about british culture it's about the fact that British culture protects white British people. And we're brought up with cultures and morals that are about being white. And Britain isn't just about being bright, um, white British. It's about so much more than that. So it's beyond this podcast and my level of understanding and how I'd probably articulate it. But please go out there and learn about your culture. When, you, when our profession is predominantly white British, it then doesn't become such a focal point that we'll have a being risk assessment tool now for staff. It, that is a massive thing, but it's because it's predominantly white British, it's, it's not. So Ganesha, really, you're really right there in terms of the reason why it was probably awkward for a friend is because, and especially if you don't have diversity amongst your friends um, or you don't have those conversations as organically, that you're exactly right. And then therefore, when you're in a formal role, it's like, my God, I can't even have this with my best mate who I've known like since he was five. Mm -hmm. So um, Jemima, do you want to come in yeah, there? I just wanted to actually just touch on what you've said about British culture. Obviously, I'm not an expert, so you feel free to correct me. Um, 
But what I've also found is in terms of just mannerisms and the way things are approached. I think with British culture, it's a lot more conservative, more subtle, you know, compared to my own Nigerian culture. You know, if you have something, if you have a problem, just, you know, we just tell you straight. We tell you straight. Um, it's very, you know, in your face sort of thing. And, you know, if we want to know something, we just ask, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think with British culture, it's just kind of more about tiptoeing a little bit more and just being careful and not wanting to offend and things like that. And it, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think um, it's just worth reflecting on that actually there's sometimes that the people that you're relating to aren't probably as sensitive about some of these things as you think that they might be. Um, so it's okay, you know, it's okay. So I think that's what I just wanted to touch on. Thank you. Uh, there might be people that caught you on that, just so you know that fact. <laughs> mm. um, but I just want to steer the conversation, and now, Rafi, I can see you've got your hand up. Um, steer the conversation. I've had a lot, and I mean a lot of messages, um, even just today, about the risk assessment tool and about how man leaders, um, you know, managers of teams feel very uncomfortable sitting down with their staff and going through the risk assessment tool. You've kind of answered that, um, that question about how to do a little bit there, Jemima, in terms of this is, this is real, this is a fact, this is awful, um, there is a correlation, we can't get away with that, how can we protect you? Um, the the organisations put this risk tool together and we need to go through and I need to know that you're supported. And one of the big things that we'll have is perceived risk. So I could have two members of staff who um, have very similar ethnic identity who would score the same, but one would feel they have a higher risk than the other might perceive it. And how we manage that as managers is actually really important because it's about being human and understanding the anxieties. And I don't know the answers to that. I'm in my own organisation. My staff will, will tell you I am just... I, I'm not sure where, where we go here because the reality is we, and especially in IT units, is we have a huge ethnic diversity in our, in our intensive care nurses, especially in London. So we need to be mindful of that. It's, it's just sad. There's not a central message coming out about this. Um, you know, it's, and this is beyond this podcast, but for me, that would really help. Um, Rafia, do you want to come in there? Um, yeah, I think um, I was going to comment about the previous conversation, but actually I think it applies just as much to this in terms of it's about relationships and building relationships. And also mm -hmm. I'm thinking specifically about the risk assessment. So there's two aspects of it. There is the tool that needs to be carried out and you've got your tool that you work through and you go through the questions, you go through step by step. But then there's also the process and what is that process like and what what does it feel like to go through that process and so there's there's two things going on there um and if it's then that's when it comes down to the relationship because the tool is not different whether you you know you could do it with a number of people the tool doesn't change but the relationship will change and the relationship will change because of the dynamics between the two people but also how uh i don't know the the, the, the emotions what a person's bringing to the table from both angles so it, there's there's a lot to consider. And like you said, Rachel, I think there's guidance on how to carry out the tool, but there's not guidance on how to introduce it, how to introduce it in a sensitive way. Um, I think things like case studies would be fantastic. Are people's views on, on the tool, the tool's just <laughs> been handed out, but there's not a lot of discussion, frank discussion about the implications of it and, and how it's going to be perceived. Absolutely. Does anyone else want to come in and comment? I think the big, the big thing is just it's it's uncomfortable. It's a, uh, it's something that has to be done, but it's it's about tactfully and yeah. Um, Adeen, do you want to come in there? Yes, I think part of the conversation is again back to that honesty and having the time and actually asking the individual. So we always say, "Not about me, without me." So it's not about making decisions for the individual or on behalf of that individual. It's about involving them in the conversation from the very start. Because my example is um, I, the, I had the risk assessment tool. I was asked to risk assess. Initially, I got the fright of my life because I thought, oh, is there something I miss? Is there something wrong? What's the big deal? Uh, and it was the most awkward conversation because my line manager couldn't come out and have that conversation with me 
And um, after having done the risk assessment tool, I didn't think there was much of a big deal. And it was her concern and her anxiety that led to the most awkward conversation because my attitude was, well, you know, it eases at ease and we just need to take the appropriate safety precautions, etc. I shared it around with my friends and colleagues and there were two camps. There was one camp that said you were very, um, you were being supported and you were being looked after. And there was another camp that was like, oh, that's ridiculous. Uh, and in sharing those experiences, I was able to help some of my friends and colleagues when they had to have the same conversation with their BAME members of staff. So again, it, it supports the not about me without me notion. Do you know, that is so powerful. And um, Ganesh, I'll come to you. It's, um, it's, it's powerful because it links in with your point, Rafia. If you have that relationship with your staff, so I can think of my staff, and please, we'll talk about Clump and being people all together um, in, in, a, in a moment. That's one of the things I want to move on to. But if you have that relationship and you know how, you kind of can know how one member of staff is going to take it over another, the, so my organization are like this is a self-assessment tool the one people are just fill it in themselves and hand and then if it flags TLA manager then have the discussion but actually it's our power as the leader of that team as the manager to say actually you know this person might need a little bit of a sit down and a coach through it or this person you might just be able to hand it to and say oh yeah do that will you and then if there's any problems just get back to us but if you don't have that relationship then that's where it all starts to fall apart already, isn't it? Now, Ganesh, can I bring you in there? Yeah, so just going back to your original point, Rachel, I mean, um, you know, obviously working for an arm's length body, I think the central messaging hasn't been there around this. It has been an, another piece of work with a, a you know, a, a link to a web page, um, which hasn't always been immersive. So it's interesting hearing your, your viewpoints in terms of, you know, being in provider land. Um, embarrassingly as well, I, I think, so two things, you know, I do a, a weekly brief with our, um, you know, lead AHPs in response, as you'll know, Rachel, with, uh, with the Nightingale work and the surge response over in East England. And um, in my brief, I, you know, I, I've now left it, at, you know, at the end of my slide deck under any other business as a link to this, I, you know, and I'm asking, are people are probably already doing this already? I, I don't know, because it's not getting fed back to me, but it's almost like I'm hiding it away from the other data that I'm presenting to them about students, about bringing back staff. Oh, and by the way, there's this here. And I feel uncomfortable talking about that because it's almost like, no one said it to me, but it's almost like a hindrance and it's almost like a, 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 an additional stress. And I think that the point around stress when we talk about human factors as well, you know, we're going through a level four national emergency. No one's been through this before. So they've got all of the stresses of, of having to manage staff, sickness, PPE, you know, no one knows. And then this on top of it, people, people just think, oh, this is another, just like when the WHO surgery checklist came out, it's another tick sheet, not knowing what to do with it. Um, and so I, I think that again, that, you know, what we talked about at the beginning, that central um, messaging, that top down role modeling, I've pushed for research. I've said, what, what works already out there? You know, a couple of the directors said there's some work in this part of West Midlands or, but no one's forthcoming with it. And I don't understand what, you know, when we look at other research around COVID, it's coming out left, right and center, but this piece here is being hidden away. Well, hidden away is not the right term, apologies, but it's just not visible. And I think for whatever reason that, I think um, makes us behave the way we do because it doesn't, uh, it's not given that credence or importance that it should be. Yeah. No, I think, you know, you've bought one to another potential, um, another potential area. And I need to be really careful with this next bit. Um, we've talked about central messaging. Um, now, Ganesh, you're involved at more strategic level, as am I. I understand the complexities of, of that. I understand the complexities that exist with putting out national messages for all, um, you know, especially when there's arm's length responsibility and it's up to trust to decide and we'll get all of that. We'll get the political stance, okay? But this is about people. This is about our staff. This is about, um, you know, lives. And if there's a moment in time where we can break that mold a little bit and set an example, this is it. Yeah. And again, it's 
beyond us to um you know um solve the NHS's national problems but actually we could move on to professional networks and professional societies so there's been strong messages to me um and you only have to look on social media about um about some of the responses or lack of responsibles from our professional organizations now this is really tricky and when we were, I don't want to kind of spoil the, the, the conversation that's about to happen from the pre-chat, but there was a couple of really good points made. And I don't know if anyone wants to start um, off by their experiences with the professional networks and, you know, have the responses been timely? Um, did we need something to come out sooner, you know, rather than two weeks down the line? Um, that's a long time, isn't it? A couple of weeks for a response on things. Who wants to, to start off? Um, <laughs> I was going to say you had some good points before. Yeah, so um, from a CSP perspective, you know, Karen, um, you know, really was quite reflective and she apologized about not saying something earlier. Um, and I think that's, um, you know, fantastic, essentially, in the sense that she was reflective and she was apologetic. But I mm -hmm. think it highlights... Um, how sometimes, well, very often, you know, we as vain people feel sidelined. We feel that we're not a priority. We feel that, um, you know, there are other things to focus on, right? And this is just yet another thing. Or if it's addressed, it's on a peripheral level, right? It's very peripheral. Let's, you know, have a conversation. Let's have a bit of a focus group. Um, and then after that, nothing happened there's no real dent um with the situation but i think from a response perspective um it was great from a csp perspective that it was addressed but it kind of echoed what oh okay you know um but nonetheless it was it was it was good to for it to be addressed yeah. So if the professional networks are listening, I think there was a sense of deprioritization on some bigger tasks. And as you yeah. mentioned so um, nicely, um, uh, Ganesh, it's, it's, it's about national priorities, strategic, but it's, it's all this. But actually, what we're saying is what we would want from our professional leaders, our societies, is that response, even if it's an acknowledgement it, I am sorry, and it's, it boiled down to what um, so, um, what one of the conversations we had um, previously in the podcasts about um, apologising, about acknowledging and acting, and I really mm. like that. Mm. Um, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to say as well, regards to um, the comments made um, following, you know, Karen's um, ap apology and her message, and you know, some people will say things along the lines of, um, you know, shouldn't, we shouldn't have to apologize for our whiteness. We shouldn't have to um, apologize for, you know, any of these things, essentially. And I think what we were saying um, just before we started recording was that, you know, there's no need to. There's no need to apologize for whiteness. There's no need to apologize for blackness or for your heritage or for your cultural upbringing. Uh, but essentially, I think what you know, Karen was saying was that I stand with you, I support you, um, and I'm sorry that I, I didn't stand with you earlier. Um, and I think that's the messaging. And I think for any um, empathetic person, that should, that should be comforting. That should be something that we should be proud of. So, yeah. Thank you. And Rafia or Sharon, do one of you want to come in? Because there was um, there's a kind of different stance from the Royal College, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Shall we share that? Let's all share it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think I personally, I think it was fascinating, really, really interesting in terms of, I'd say fairly early on, the chief exec of the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy came out with a comment and she is fame herself in terms of she has had experiences previously um, as a result of ethnicity so she feels um, empathy and alliance with um, the Black Lives Matters movement. Um, now what was interesting was um, there were uh, some of the responses and this really shows social media and the way that it works, um, responses from 
kind of a wide range of members from the Royal College um, membership, from students through to practitioners who, who push for more, who push for action. And I think it really represents the fact that it, it wasn't necessarily to do with the ethnicity of the person, it was to do with more than what that person represented. So it was looking at this hierarchy and that this body represents a profession and the responsibility of this profession to do more than just make a comment, to actually put into place action. So what was wanted and needed was action. And that was regardless of the ethnicity of the person, the chief exec, who, who, who was who's kind of the visual kind of representative. So it wasn't to do with that necessarily. It was more to do with we want more than um, kind of lip service. We want to say what actions are being put in place. And also, I guess it's it's because it's on uh, a lot of this was through Twitter uh, and it's very fast paced and it's very instant, but also there's, it breaks down hierarchies and if someone posts a com comment and other people relate to that, that's what brings it to the surface. It's, it's if it's representing something that is uh, lots of people can identify with, that's what brings it to the surface and that's what makes it a priority, which is quite different to how things have been done in the past and maybe how institutions work. Um, and I think it possibly then needs to, well it does it it um it, it insists on change faster change more active change and it holds that accountability so until that change is seen or until the wheels are set into motion that message keeps getting pushed over and over again because i think we can all agree that um that the, the nature of Bain experiences in healthcare hasn't changed much over an extended period of time. So I've been practicing for 15 years and it's been very slow and steady. Um, and I think that there's a difference, a difference in terms of how people are using their voices and how that voice is being projected and how that voice is being raised and the expectation as a response to that is different as well. Um, so yeah, I just, I just think it's a very interesting time. Mm. Sharon? Yeah, just to add, I mean, Rafi said I think so beautifully there, but I think for me, what was interesting was that initially the statement um, representing the Royal College's speech library was from um, the chief executive herself, who, like Rafi said, was um, BAME. And for me, it was like, well, it's it's not about individuals making comments. This it's isn't about kind of, you know, yes, um, the, the chief executive is BAME, but it's, I think for me, it, it, it wasn't until we got a, an actual comment or um, statement from representing Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy as a body that really it kind of resonates as much because I think otherwise just back to kind of oh this is like an individual's you know responsibility to make a statement and that's that's not the point it's about demonstrating um kind of that this is a responsibility for everyone like so I think um yes and then it you know through social media like Rafi said we did then get a statement that was much more kind of representative of, of not just an individual but the, the the body and um something that you know was tangible in kind in terms of kind of um comments and I think that's important because if if, if what we get is an individual statement then it kind of it doesn't demonstrate to everybody else or, you know all the therapists on the ground that this is everyone's responsibility you, you know mm -hmm. we kind of come back to this kind of oh it's it's, it's not me, uh, you know, I'm not racist. So I think that that, that change um, was really helpful and, a, a, you know, a positive outcome from the kind of push from people saying, well, that isn't actually enough. We want, we want more, we want more. And then we, you know, and, and we kind of got quite um, constructive um, conversation and dialogue and actions. Adine, do you want to come in there? It's about the actions. So we've been having this conversation for such a long time. And we understand that change is slow. We get that. However, as great and as appreciated as it is when people open themselves up and open themselves up to criticism, to compliments, to disparity, etc., it is about following that up with action. And until people see action, then it's just lip service. And that's not from a physiotherapy perspective. That's not the direction we should be going in. I mean, absolutely. And Ganesh, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that until I... Um... No, absolutely. no I, I agree with Adine. Like you say, it's, it's taking away from that sort of tokenistic approach and the tokenism, making it real. Um, um, uh, uh, because like you say, this, the, taking it away from that sort of peaks and troughs, you know, it needs to be constant, it needs to be on the agenda all the time. Um, and needs to be part of our everyday parlance, not like you say, just in reaction to an event, in reaction to something that someone has done or um, an incident. So, um, 
you know, it happens at schools. You know, my, my little boy, he's seven. Um, you know, he happily will talk about um, the questions he's asked his friends. When he describes friends from school, it, it's almost like five minutes before I realise who he's talking about because he never once mentions colour. He'll describe, you know, you know, the one with the blue bag, you know, the, and it's like, why has he not gone straight to the, because that's not how children think. Mm. So therefore it's learnt behavior with us, isn't it? I always, I always get um, annoyed when, you know, they talk about a new member of staff joining and it's like, oh, you know, oh yeah, Dean, you know, the, the black lady, or why does that need to be said? Why is it important? Why, why, why can we not say a Dean and then describe, um, you know, profession where, you know, where she worked previously um, because then it then forms those those biases. But then at the same time, uh, are they always negative biases? Until you have those discussions, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't become clear, does it? So mm-hmm. I, I think as well, it just needs to be, um, 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 you know, made an important part of our everyday agenda. Like I said, I hide behind these things sometimes because I feel other people aren't comfortable talking about it when I'm, you know, presenting or... Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, it, it's it has been heartening that the the, the um, conversations, the approaches from senior leadership recently. But I want that to be consistent, and it's the same with sports. You know, I think it when we see the, the footballers and the racers in there, what's the messaging tell us when you know the the the, the bans or the the penalties are, are minuscule? It doesn't tell everyone how serious it is. Yet, when we get this virus, bang, we're on it. We can react to those things. Yet. Racism and, and, and issues around colour, background, is every bit as serious as that. And obviously, you know, with the majority of the, you know, healthcare workforce being from BAME background as well, we're going to be delivering that care. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it, it again boils down to British culture, in my opinion. This is one of my theories. So in terms of why, why is why do white people automatically go to the colour? Because it's visually different from us. Mm. It's visually, so it's easy. If a black woman walked into the room, you wouldn't say, oh, the lady over there with the red handbag. You would say the black lady over there. And that is my brutal honesty because it's, in, it's inherent brought up in us that that is the difference, the skin colour. It's colourism. So it's, that, that's one of the potential answers. And it's, again, this cultural understanding. And the second thing I want to talk, when you mentioned about the sport thing, this is a whole fascinating area for me. It's different within sports, though. In rugby, I go to rugby and football matches. You would never have that level of racism in a rugby match. Um, in, the, in England. <laughs> in England. Um, because it's not in their culture. Just like you respect the referee, there's respect. And it's, it's interesting for me why, and again, it's a culture, it's a culture of sport, it's a culture of what's acceptable. Um, and I may be totally wrong there, but, but it's that my experiences is, is, is it's, again, it boils down to this cultural understanding. Go on, Ganesh. I'll, I'll just say, I mean, I, 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 I've been to, I'm a football fan, but I've been to rugby games and, and the atmosphere is totally different. What I will say is when they describe players, especially back in the past, you look at Ellery Hanley, um, Martin Fire. The way they describe those players and the positions that they get those players to play in are racially stereotypes, roles, you know, the, the fast players, the strong players. So that there is, however subtle, there is that background. Racial racism is perhaps not the right term, but there is that stereotype there. Indirect, Sorry. which we'll yeah. come on to, mm-hmm. the indirect parts. Adine, you wanted to come in there. Uh, a couple of points. One is to pick up on Rafia's point around... Um, from a, a bottom-up approach and and social media being able to stimulate that that's how how um autocracies previously have fallen that's certainly from my experience how uh, the apartheid government was dismantled it was definitely from the bottom up so it was youth who had boycotts and protested and caused disruption and unrest and i think there's a lot to be said for that but in a manner that is um, proactive and that stands up for the right reasons and that gets the action going that we need it to. And then a po- um, to pick up on Ganesh's point about um, kids in colour, they don't see colour. It's my friend with the pink hair or, you know, the one that came to visit two days ago or something similar. And it's those sort of continuous messages that we need to keep on promoting, that it shouldn't be about colour. Completely true. 
I hear you. Rafia, do you want to come in? And then I'm going to change it slightly. Go in. Yeah, it's just uh, just a quick comment, I suppose. And I think it might lead into the indirect um, conversation that I think you're moving towards um, to do with British culture. And again, I think with all of this, it's, it, it is quite a complex area. And I would say I work in um, a very diverse area and the, the reality of the profession is that it's not diverse. However, I don't feel that my colleagues have I think their views are diverse because of the area that they work and I, I personally don't think that my non um Bain colleagues would necessarily their first thing to think would be this is a person of colour and that's their first description of that person but that reflects the area where I'm working at the moment other areas where I've worked there's there's less of that diversity within the population and so it's more normalised to refer to someone in a certain way and so mm -hmm. even British culture what is British culture and how, you know how, it, it depends if you live somewhere urban or if you uh, live in the suburbs and you know there's so so many intricacies and I think it's all right for someone who's, who's sitting there listening to the spot podcast and say think oh, actually that doesn't reflect me I would never think that and I would never say that and that that, that 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 will be true but there'll be another person who may not be aware that that's actually ingrained thinking that they might not be aware of and that's okay you know in terms of if that's your starting point but I think what's important is to acknowledge the implications of that and what is happening and what is the result of that and and so I guess just this this British culture, again, like you said, a lot of these things <laughs> can go on to mass conversations and there, there'll be thinkers out there who can probably put it across a lot better. But that was my, my initial instinct that actually where I work at the moment, that, that wouldn't be an immediate way of describing somebody. I, I genuinely believe that and generalising a team as a whole, but I don't think that would be the case. But there have been other areas I've worked where that would more likely be the case. Do you know, and that, that's a really strong point. So um, moving on to that exact area. So there is some great examples and staff have told me how inclusive departments are, even if they're not incredibly diverse, probably because people have been on this learning journey and took the time to understand and appreciate and acknowledge differences that exist within our society, you know, within our heritage, within our culture, within our ethnicity. And I genuinely believe that's because of education and people understand so it becomes inherent it becomes an inherent part of your being and that then becomes infectious in a team um so I'm not going to sit here and say I think everything's bad that I've experienced but I have been that person that has ignored indirect racism sometimes because it was easy I was so busy juggling a million things and I, th I stopped and I thought is that right is that right what I've heard and if not shall I call it out and I haven't and I've lost sleep over me remembering them events and now in this moment in time thinking, God, I wish if I'd knew what I know now, I would have, I would have made that stand. I can't go back in time, but I can make a difference now and make a difference with meaning. So please, for those people that are out there like me who are in that situation or have done that, um, please do not beat yourself up about it now. Use it as a catalyst to learn and move, make a change from now because we have this movement. So what I, what I kind of want to ask is any people's examples of what I mean by indirect racism, because I can give you things that I've learned from my perspective. But what, what, do, what do managers of teams need to look out for? What do they, if they think this doesn't exist in my team, this, is, this isn't a problem, what are they not seeing that may potentially be there? Who wants to kick off? This is a brave area. <laughs> no, I think I don't. I don't think I can. I can talk more around the teams um, examples in regards to the teams. So I know, personally, for myself, the indirect relation um, racism stereotypes that has almost worked in a positive way for me. Um, you know, especially on my sort of leadership journey, sat in you know in board meetings or clinical advisory groups, and you know, there's me in a shirt and tie, and straight away people assume. I'm a GP or a consultant, you know, of medical background. So, but then when they find out, uh, you know, an AHP, the behavior towards me changes as well. But I mean, that's, that's a, a different aspect there, but straight away because of me being Indian, even there in a certain type, majority of the people in those meetings, but they've made an assumption there. So, um, so it, yeah, that indirect um, stereotype behavior can, you know, work in, in, in one of two ways there. But I, I think it's, you know, I don't think I can recall any, you know, specific examples of how it works within my team. So perhaps my colleagues here are a better place to 
Jemima. Yeah, I think similar to Ganesh, I'm, I'm probably going to speak from a personal um, perspective. Um, and this can uh, help answer the question a little bit better. Um, but I think um, when I first graduated, essentially, and I, um, you know, started my first job, and one of the first things that I was told by, you know, my seniors um, was that, you know, you're going to be managing this ward. What we need you to do is to survive, right? Just try and survive. Just get through it. Don't worry too much about anything else. Just get through it, right? And that's just a metaphor uh, very often for how, you know, I felt in terms of my career. Um, it's just about just survive. <laughs> just get through it. Yeah, just try and make it through. Um, and, you know, I've seen this in kind of in implicit ways, in ways I've seen my colleagues kind of, they've gotten groomed in a way to, you know, occupy senior positions or to occupy different roles or to have different responsibilities and so on and so forth. It's because, you know, you speak like us, you talk like us, we relate to you. So it's just a natural affinity. Right? So because of this natural affinity that I have towards you, I'm more likely to give you know, this position to you. And I think what managers need to be careful of is to be reflective about that. Right? To say, actually, this person doesn't look like me. I don't, you know, I'm not quite sure, but let me engage. Right? Let me engage with this person uh, and let me see what their interests are. And, you know, I, I think... That's what I've experienced uh, from my perspective, that actually it's not just about BAME people surviving and getting through <laughs> for anyone really, but particularly BAME people, it's, there's, there's scope to thrive as well. Mm. Absolutely, Rafia. Um, just, just adding on, I guess, to what you might have just said, and um, again, bringing it to my profession, because that's why I know best. So um, if you ask most people how they got into speech and language therapy, it's because they know someone who's a speech and language therapist, whether it be a friend or a family member, or a family member or a family member. And so it's, so it's very circular. So people go into the profession because they know somebody in the profession, at least to somebody else they know, getting interested into the profession. And I think it's one of the main reasons why there's just shift in terms of the demographics of the profession has changed so slowly because there's not less reaching out and I think this reaching out the responsibility is with the managers and with the educational establishments in terms of trying to break that cycle and go beyond that cycle and actually go into the communities that we serve um, go into those communities and 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 show because at the moment those communities are only seeing um, clinicians from certain backgrounds coming in to fix to solve <laughs> and, and then that creates this them and us culture and actually how great to have role models from the same community and then working with the community and then working with the counterparts who are non-BME as well and working together and collaborating and 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 I think that's where the change is there and, and like I said right it's not just about surviving but it's about aspirations and giving that aspiration to people who might not have seen this profession and it goes back to I think Ganesh if you're Indian you're a doctor or a dentist um, what's an AHP why are you going into that profession we don't know anyone from that profession what you know where has that even come from and you know my mum only kind of got it when I started working in a hospital oh you work in a hospital mm -hmm. kind of but it is it's about breaking those and I think it's about um the circle is is not necessarily a circle it's just a situation you know people go into something that they're familiar with but they know someone with but I think the responsibility lies with those in leadership positions to then break that circle because it all goes back to who are our primary service users and how can we uh, support them best by supporting the staff and how can we support the staff by increasing the diversity so it's it's it's, it's widening the circle so that you know there's a place for more people. Sharon can I come to you? Yeah, it's kind of just reflecting on what Rafi was just saying, whereas I think there's so much that needs to go into that in terms of diversifying the professions, you know, specifically speech and language therapy, as obviously what I'm familiar with. And I think it's it's partly about obviously trying to promote it to sort of college age students and kind of um, understanding what the current barriers are, you know, finding out from students at sort of 
you know, six or more GCSE level, you know, why, what have you heard of speech therapy? Why, why wouldn't you go, out, go into it and kind of seeing if there are some inherent kind of stereotypes about the profession that is kind of hindering. But at the same level, the leadership side, I think if there aren't role models or mentors that if students were to come around a hospital and kind of do some work experience or do, you know, do a ch ch chuddling, they don't see um, BAME leaders or senior senior role models to kind of be like oh if I did get into that profession then I could I would get to I could potentially get to this level then it could still kind of not put off but it's not necessarily kind of a positive kind of experience if they don't see that and I think that then links in with this issue that's kind of come up with kind of statistics and things about you know the the, the movement of BAME professionals through kind of into senior roles and kind of it's, it's one thing to get more people into the profession but then it's also how do they progress through the profession because people need to see that if they go into something they've got scope to to grow and to improve and to kind of you know I could I be, could become a senior I could become a manager and I think that it's you know it's such, it's such a big topic but for you know I've done quite a lot of um talks in the past with um, big BAME, BAME um, sixth form students kind of encourage them into speech and language therapy and to kind of talk about you know um my journey into it and things and one of the things is a little bit about kind of our own stereotypes and culture around kind of what is a medical profession and understanding in our families about AHPs and what what that all is and that's that's something that we you know we can do to kind of educate our own circles and things mm -hmm. but also um you know people some of the students have said you know we don't see um if they think of consultants or doctors you, you would see a lot of BAME um uh, consultant surgeons very senior level but from an AHP perspective that isn't necessarily the same so there, there is we, we might not think it but even at that age they're noticing mm. that mm -hmm. if I want to you know be kind of you know at, at some point in my future you know a, a leader that th this doesn't seem to be as easy as or doesn't seem to be as common as it does in in being a, mm. a doctor and we, we do know, I think it's recognised now within NHS England that that is an issue. And I know there's some work streams going on, HP work streams going on in London and beyond uh, to um, address the diversity gap, which is actually more prevalent in the HPs than any of the other healthcare mm. professionals. Mm. But Ganesh, I know you've been um, wanting to come in there. I'm going to go Ganesh, then Nadine. Sorry, yeah. So, so two things actually. So in answer to your first point, actually, in terms of management behaviours, I think it, we need to review our recruitment process as well. I don't think that's um, that's fit for purpose um, anymore in terms of uh, recruiting for jobs or even recruiting at um, university and schools as well. So that that's something that as managers and leaders we can reflect on and and best advise how how to move forward. So I don't know the answer to that. Uh, it seems a bit strange when you know you. You look for a car and you go on to Auto Trader and you tick all the boxes of, of a car that you want, but without test driving that car, how do you know it's the right thing? And it's to say, I think it, we're not teasing out the right um, uh, um, characteristics in our, in our um, um, staff and students. Yeah. But your point, um, uh, Sharon, around the, the, the BAME consultants and medics, actually, you, you, you do see a lot of you know, consultants, surgeons, physicians but you don't see a lot from BAME background at you know, medical director level, at the mm -hmm. arm's length body level mm -hmm. as well. It's still a very yeah, white uh, dominant um, profession there. Sorry, that's fine. No, role models has been a consistent theme throughout here. So just to pre-warn you from some of the po podcasts, you're now going to be them. So mm. <laughs> watch out. You've got to, you'll have a lot of people coming your way and um, a lot of people asking your advice and they look up to you, which is fantastic. Adine. So a couple of things. One is that for a lot of BAME communities, and certainly in my experience, we might be the first people who get to university who get to tertiary education for a lot of our families. And that's something that we cannot underestimate because the social capital associated with getting yourself to tertiary is huge. And if you don't have that social capital, how the heck are you going to get there? So an example I've got is my husband's a teacher in Newham, which is one of the most underprivileged areas in London. 
and he's a year six teacher. And the difficulty he has with a lot of his students between September and just before Christmas is nobody wants to do anything. You know, after you, after high school, nobody has any clue about what they necessarily want to do, or it's very stereotyped. After Christmas and with a lot of coaching and mentorship and all the rest of it, everybody has some sort of university idea of what they want to do and where they want to go. And I never thought I could be. The other thing I think to be very aware of is from a management behaviors point of view, yes, it comes down to recruitment, but it's also that understanding from a recruitment perspective that it's about values. It's not necessarily about in the box and it's about looking at what that recruit and especially if it's a recruit from a BAME background what they bring and I don't think sometimes from an interviewer's perspective that's necessarily the areas we perhaps focus on and then very very lastly another example is at one of the universities out of the something like two and a half thousand PhD students under 80 students are from a BAME background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Jemima I'll come to you, <laughs> is it quick? <laughs> I'm very conscious of time. Uh, yes it, it is quick actually. I guess Go it's for it. a reiteration of what's been said already that yes like recruitment is so important but I think retention and also progression is so so important i think it's very easy to put so much energy on recruitment uh, and neglect the others so i think everything needs to work in synergy with each other you've just stolen my thunder there Jemima. <laughs> so maybe i'm going to come back to you for this next bit Pro ganesh progression a dean everything you've said about professional development and having that seal that glass top ceiling Jemima, what you've just said about retention. So I think the appraisal system is fundamentally flawed to, in some respects for people of being background, but more, more importantly than skin colour about cultural differences and diversity. And um, some of that's down to mannerisms and cultural behaviours of people from different backgrounds that aren't bright, white British, because again, the appraisal system is designed for this white British culture I, I keep talking about and some people think well that's rubbish it's not it's designed for a system but actually it doesn't allow cultural differences to be recognized and I think that can hold people back because they don't perform in a way that we de de determine is correct and if we don't fit that professional mold about not speaking out about till you know when you're allowed to have an opinion when you're band seven level and you know, everything's got to go past people and you've got to get permission to do things. And if you're that more like phenotype or character where you are more assertive and more direct, and that's about you expressing your opinions through a cultural perspective, like that, that just doesn't, in fact, it can actually hold you back. And I think mm. people become oppressed by that system. So a good leader and manager, and this is for all of you out there that do appraisal systems, do you take the time to know about your stuff, boil down the relationships again and understand that cultural differences and how sometimes that may come across? I learned this because I've had to manage, um, and I said this in my, one of my other podcasts, an Indian male physio who was one, they wanted me to performance manage him when I came into a role because he was aggressive and confrontational and he wasn't. It was his cultural differences. It was whether he was speaking to his mum, his child his wife a patient it was the same mannerisms he's had no one took the time to understand that and actually say we can't anglicize people because we think that's the right thing to do but it's about society and it's about being respectful of each other's and how and it's the same with patients so you go to that male indian patient and they won't respond to you by going howie do you want to get up now should we go for a walk they'll be like no thanks <laughs> so what happens that that physio will just say okay i'll come back tomorrow whereas if you had a completely if you if you approach that patient in a way that they would relate to so going back to my original point on this because i could talk about this for ages um appraisal systems how can we make them more culturally diverse from now without going through a whole you know appraisal training package what what little things would matter do you think for people that are doing appraisals at the moment um, Jemima, if you haven't got a comment straight away, if you need to think, I'm going to go. Yeah, I'll think. Yeah, okay. yeah. Raffia. Um, honest answer to that is I don't know, but I wanted to just throw in something 
which for me was food for thought as you were speaking. I think um, as, as allied health professionals, all of us on this main panel have chosen a career path, which is not the norm. So we've chosen something that is slightly different, that's slightly more, perhaps more challenging. We've kind of gone and kind of paved our own way. So then it's not surprising that that's our approach to work and looking at um, alternative ways of doing things, looking at innovative ways of doing things. And it's not necessarily challenging the system. It's just the way we are. There's something about us that, you know, we saw the benefits of the profession. We ne didn't necessarily look at the, 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 the draw drawbacks of, of applying to a profession that's not uh, representative of who we are necessarily. And so I think then it's almost it shouldn't be a huge surprise that um, <laughs> that, that then we, we come up with ideas that are slightly different and that should be celebrated and encouraged for all, but mm. it, it shouldn't really be surprising that we come up with that. And I think it, this it says a lot that um, a lot of us have, have kind of developed and progressed in our careers and still clinically active, but have, again, branched out. So, you know, gone into uh, academia and gone into innovative working and maybe that is an aspect that if you've got someone from a vein background within a role that is not uh, you know traditionally a vein role so like our led health professionals it shouldn't really be that surprising then that the appraisal system doesn't fit mm -hmm. as neatly mm -hmm. so sharon have you got any tips on how yeah yeah i mean the thing two, two things came to mind i think the first one being about you know when we're doing things for our clients or our patients we we often focus on this patient-centered approach but you know how much do we do that for our colleagues our members of our team and things and just trying to make that appraisal process a little bit more personalized when it you know for everyone but I think particularly when it comes to um Bay members of a team because I think for me, sometimes it's about just understanding the person's personal experience, like you're sitting in an appraisal, at, you know, they're at band seven or whatever level, but how did they get there? Like kind of, a lot of it is kind of focused on like what your objective is, what's next, but actually it's really helpful to understand where they've come from, like what their experience has been to get to this point in their career or to get to this meeting that you're in right now, because actually there are some there are some traits of, of things that have kind of experiences that are more common for, for fame people, you know, the sense of having to feel like you have to prove yourself or having to kind of, you know, um, I don't know, people have often talked about, you know, feeling like you have to work out a little bit harder to get to get somewhere to make yourself known. And I think part of that appraisal process should be kind of acknowledging kind of where's this, what's this person's journey been so far? What, what What's their perspective and kind of their experience to kind of understand that personal experience. And then it's a more personalized conversation, but it's one you kind of, you know, especially if it is a non-white person doing that appraisal, it kind of gets you a bit of a sense of, you know, where this person's come mm -hmm. from and, and what, what potentially that privilege that you might have experienced as a manager, might, you, you know, one of how you can mm -hmm. adjust that. So those would be like, I think, my Your two tips. Jemima, I'm going to come to you and then I'm going to start wrapping up for some comments. Go yeah, for it. First thing I want to say, I feel like clapping for my panel members because they captured it so well. Um, and I think it, it almost feels like, you know, they're the physio box. Right? There's an OT box and there's a salt box. There's an AHP box that you have to you have to look like and you have to fit into. And to progress, you have to follow you know route one, two, and three. And you're interested in you know I don't know apples and bananas, and it just doesn't seem to correlate at all with what the route of progression is. And I think you know when it comes to appraisals, it needs to acknowledge the fact that as you know, my colleagues have said that there will be a non-conventional course, right? That a BAME person might take, you know, it's not that they will take, but they might take. And, you know, we should be open to that. We should be open to that. I know when I wanted to do you know, different things myself, this is from a personal level, you know, I have people say to me, my, from managers to my colleagues, you know, what's that? You know, why are you going to, why are you doing that? And, um, and it kind of, amplifies that otherness that mm -hmm. oh you're an other because you're an HP and you're also an other because you're also wanting to do these other things that doesn't seem to fit into this box so I think an acknowledgement of that would would help really with appraisals absolutely absolutely now I'm aware here she comes back in Adine's coming back in the building um hopefully she's back, back. 
Great. So we're just in time. So we're just going to start rounding up, uh, Dean. So if I try and bring this all together, the whole point of this car, um, podcast was to start changing the culture of conversations for our emerging leaders. So those people that might be in clinical management roles, supervision roles, however you define yourself. The biggest theme that's come across for me is about relationships. So getting those relationships with staff, getting relationships within your team at all level, because we need to make changes across the system because those newly qualified staff, and there's a whole podcast for them, they are going to come through the system and they need to have the same beliefs and morals um, as we have as the leaders and then above us. So get to know your team. If you need help on how to do that, reach out and ask people who you would think are good leaders, ask people who have really good team dynamics. And there is really great examples out there. We need to push for more central messaging. We are the NHS. We are, you know, any system we work in, health, cross health and social care. If a majority of us are saying we actually need some, some th- messages to come out that are f- from our organization that we work in, that is a good thing. Be honest with us, be open. We're very loyal to you. We're very loyal to the National Health Service, to Health Education England, to the statutory bodies. So please give us that respect back. So that may be something we'll have to take away and think, how can we do that? How can we influence? Within our professional societies, We need to go back and feed back to them in a responsible way. This is what we want, whether it's about an issue about race, culture, sexuality, disability. We want you to have a timely response that's meaningful, not a token gesture because they're putting out something corporate. And I've seen the corporate messages that have come out from some organizations. And I've seen the ones that have heart, have meaning. You can physically feel that person in that CEO role or whoever typing the message themselves. Um, that, that has meaning to people and it adds value. And when staff are valued, everything else tends to follow. We are encouraging staff to listen, to ask, be, acknowledge, apologize. If it comes naturally, I'm sorry for what you're going through. Do you want to talk about it? Can I learn? Um, don't put pressure on some staff will want to talk some staff won't um and it's about having that safe space for the conversation and if you're not sure how to create it again that should just come organically the more confident you get we need role models we've all said we need to be going into to schools we need to be saying like ganesh said we don't want to just have the token ethnicity racial difference um, you know, we don't want to have diversity just for the sake of it. We want to have it because it's meaningful and it's a right thing for people so they have equal opportunities. And we need to have equal opportunities will be within skill sets, whether it will be even within personality types, um, will be how people are driven and what their experience, life experiences have been. But to get equality, we need an equal playing field. And while people like me don't understand what privilege they have, then that will never happen in a society where in in our professions that are particularly of British white heritage. So that is, that is a really important message to me to get across and we're all in this together. So I think it was you, Raphael, that said BAME and non-BAME. Well, actually what you mean is everyone. So it's, it's everyone and it's about whatever we do next and it's at the, this cannot lie on the hands of our colleagues of color completely. We have to listen and we, it's, I can't, I don't walk in your shoes. I don't know what your community needs, but I have a platform and I can help you. And if we all come together in this across the professional networks, across the professional bodies, and then centrally, how powerful would that message be? And I can't remember a time in my career where that's happened with anything. So maybe the time is now. So I don't wanna have the last words here, and I've got no idea how long we've been talking for, but it is over an hour. Um, but I want to give everyone the opportunity to have final comments. Um, so, Rafia, can I come to you, please? Um, I guess I just want to say thank you, Rachel. I think thank you so much for reaching out to us and 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 creating this space for us, talking about safe space. This is this feels like a safe space that's then hopefully going to go out into a wider platform. But I think your honesty and your passion and your drive to create a leveling playing field has led to there hasn't been that awkwardness of discussing things which some of this 
has been quite personal for me and I felt quite comfortable discussing it because of the way that you facilitated. And I think if that can be replicated across health by leaders, I mean, as a role model, we talk about different role models, I definitely see you as a role model. So thank you. Oh, thank you. But honestly, there is so many people like me and you are the role models now. So this is about you guys. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's make this about you guys. Adine. Oh, is Adine frozen again? She hasn't, has she? <laughs> oh no, she's oh. back. Adine, are you back? Oh, Ganesh, can I come to you, Ganesh? Yeah, sure. Uh, you've stolen my uh, thunder there, Rafi. No, no, you've been fantastic, Rachel, and thanks for the, the opportunity. I think, I think um, if I was to sum up in three points here, so uh, enable our staff, speak to our staff, so your points about appraisal is enable them to ask about career progression give them give them the space to to create what they want to do going forwards because a lot of the time i don't think they feel confident enough to ask about what the opportunities are or they don't understand what the opportunities are so there's a role modeling there um a, a, accountability you know at the end of staff and team briefings we talk about three points what are we going to do make this part of a regular agenda say what are you going to do to change culture what are you going to do to to be more inclusive around whatever it is and bring that accountability back so so it becomes uh, uh, a point of discussion uh, and um <laughs> split the last two bits there i think courage um we shouldn't have to talk about it like this but it it, it takes a lot of courage for people with have a background to have these conversations and making them feel comfortable about having those conversations to understand you in the first place and as Rafi has said from the very beginning that's how you build those relationships um, and, and I, I think um, going forward with all of you I, I can see the, the energy coming through the screen especially Rafi and the guys we're very expressive with our hands aren't we and I think mm -hmm. it, it comes across that way and you can see how passionate it is and hopefully other people will feed off that thank you thank you is Adine back in the building I don't think she can hear oh can she can you hear with Adine no. Um, Jemima, I'm going to come to you next. Yes, thank you. I wanted to say thank you as well to you, Rachel, uh, for reaching out to me personally. Thank you. Um, I think I just wanted to emphasize again uh, the importance of just listening, um, listening both ways um, and having conversation and having safe spaces to make mistakes um, on both sides. Um, no Bain, you know, Bain people aren't homogenous, white people aren't homogenous, you know, we're not just one thing or, you know, stereotyped into one thing. So you really need to be able to listen to understand the individual. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that's important. Thank you. Sharon? Yeah, I think this has been like a really great conversation for me. And I think what I want to sort of say is like, you know, leadership's all about sort of leading by example. And I think uh, hopefully that this has been, been a really good example for people to say that, you know, the conversation can be done. It can be done in an honest, open way. Um, and that there's no, there's kind of, there's no, there's no wrong or right way, but it's just about having that conversation. And I really just really hope that it's kind of a, a chance for us to kind of keep going, that we don't just end with this conversation or this one podcast, but that people go out and sort of, you know, keep talking, keep the conversations going. It, it shouldn't be, this is this needs to be kind of a permanent ongoing dialogue but um hopefully this is a a nice example of how you know it, it can be done you know mm -hmm. yeah and you've got to hold us to account so if in two months time i pipe down you'll be like hey moses <laughs> yeah, exactly. get back on that get back on it um adine you're gonna have the final words my <laughs> lovely <laughs> being part of this conversation is the start i think to us being able to push from the bottom up i think it's the start of us being able to continue that conversation to widen participation to highlight to people that you know value me for me and the skills and expertise and experiences i bring not for what you want me to be oh and god that's made me emotional that I, i'm not gonna lie i don't know what i say um so I think that is probably a good time to end the recording. Thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you've enjoyed it. Everyone, please leave comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.